Historically, in my 30 years here, we have focused almost entirely on expositing books of the Bible, literally from Genesis to Revelation and many, many books in between. But this year we're going to do something different. This year we're not going to focus on one or two books of Scripture. We're going to focus on men and women whose stories are relayed to us in Scripture. We're going to focus on people. We're entitling our theme and our series, Faith at Ground Level, Narratives of Life. And each weekend this year, including the holiday weekends, we will be looking at a man, a woman, a young person, an older person, a believer, perhaps even an unbeliever, and <clears throat> considering what God has to say to us through their stories. And as we consider those stories, I believe God will do two things. First of all, God will use the stories of people to encourage us. Because many of these stories will affirm the stubbornness of God's love, even when he encounters the stubbornness of our sin. I like what C.S. Lewis said in that regard. <clears throat> he said, the moment we put ourselves in Jesus' hands, he is committed to our perfection, no matter the cost, and he will not let us rest until it's accomplished. Many of these stories will illustrate God's stubborn love. But other stories will function as warnings to us because people can either be encouragements or they can be warnings. The theologian Helmut Tielke observed that even when we are at worship as we are today, the wolves may be howling in our souls. And somebody recently did a study indicating that of all the biblical characters whose lives are described for us on the pages of Scripture, of all those who appear to start out well in faith, approximately 60% of them got sidetracked, didn't finish well, and some of them lost their way out of the kingdom altogether. And so we sometimes need the stories of people's failures to remind us where we need to be careful. So all this year, every weekend, we'll be looking at another story taken from the pages of Scripture. This weekend, the first character we're going to consider is a man who isn't even named for us. His name is unknown to us. He is simply known by his passionate appeal and Jesus' liberating response. His appeal and Jesus' response are both found in Luke chapter 23, the 42nd and 43rd verses. And our character was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. With small apologies to Eddie Money and Geico, I've entitled this weekend's teaching, Two tickets to paradise. Let's look to the Lord together in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, in these coming moments, by your Holy Spirit, enable me to speak your truth. That's what folks have come for. Not my opinion, but your truth. And help all of us to apply that truth as best we can where we are as we continue to grow in grace and in our knowledge of you. And as always, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And as we study God's Word together today, may the Lord be with you. This opening story in our year-long series of stories could be called a narrative of great hope. But ironically, it unfolds in what appears to be a very hopeless setting. And the fact that it does touches a chord within our hearts because it reminds us of something we need to always hold on to. When our divinely intended destiny has been stifled by sin or derailed by disappointment or suffocated by cynicism or pummeled by pain, God's saving work in us isn't stymied. It isn't defeated. He will still set us free 
wherever and whenever we call to him in faith. Even if our wherever is a place of execution, even if our whenever occurs in the 11th hour of life, he is still able to set us free. And human beings continually need that reminder because God has placed within us a stubborn desire for fresh starts and better results. That desire is meant to draw us to him, the one who makes all things new. And we instinctively long for the better because goodness is older than sin. The goodness of God existed before he created this creation, before he created man, and before man began to sin. Goodness predates sin. And because we are created in the image of an ancient God who is without beginning and without end, our hearts instinctively long for that which has the longest shelf life. They long for the good and for better results and for fresh starts. That's why every year around this time, you'll hear the words of the poet Tennyson quoted, ring out the old, ring in the new. We're always looking for something to bolster our hope. And even when hope is like that friend who promises to call but never does, we still pick up the phone with anticipation. We're always hoping for something better, something good. But before better things can come our way, there are some things that have to be jettisoned and taken to the curb. And so after saying, ring out the old, ring in the new, Tennyson continued by saying, ring out the false, ring in the true. He understood that many times for us to experience the better things that God has for us, we have to get rid of the bad things we're currently holding on to. You see, behind every defeat, behind every despair, there is a spiritual deception. And that spiritual deception requires the antidote of truth. Behind every despair, behind every defeat, there is what the Apostle Paul called a spiritual stronghold. A stronghold is just a prison made of lies. Lies that have been painstakingly erected one lie at a time by the one who is called the father of lies. And he's assisted by other people. And we offer him a great deal of assistance ourselves. And soon we find our lives tyrannized by well-implanted lies. Well, those lies have to be detected and recognized for what they are. But that's not enough. Once they're detected, they have to be rejected. And that's not enough. Once they're rejected, they have to be replaced with truth or they'll flow right back into the vacuum all over again. But if we detect the lies and reject the lies and replace the lies with the antidote of truth, then our transformation can move forward and we can experience more of the good things that God has in store for those he loves and for those who love him. And that advance in our transformation is possible because this story declares something to us. It declares that where we've been doesn't have to determine where we're going. In other words, your past need not dictate your future. We don't know anything about this thief's past. We don't know how his feet came to find the path of crime. He may have engaged in criminal activity because of greed. Or perhaps he was lazy. Or perhaps he was in the bondage of poverty and was absolutely desperate. Or perhaps he fell in with bad influences and bad company. We don't know. But what we do know is despite his criminal past, his destiny changed in one brief moment of faith. When he encountered Jesus, he was securely fastened to a cross on the fast track to a tragic end and out of options. Nobody looked at a man being crucified and said, well, he has several options. He was out of options for all intents and purposes. But as quickly as you can say Jesus, 
everything changed. His heart changed. His forwarding address changed. He found himself one of two people holding a fast, nonstop ticket to paradise. Now, Jesus didn't say, today you will be with me in heaven. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Big difference. Paradise, paradise was just one Hebrew name for that place where the spirits of God's righteous saints went after their death. And there, under God's protective custody, they awaited the triumph of Jesus, the cross and the resurrection. After that triumph, then Jesus would come for them and declare his victory and lead them out and translate them into the presence of the Father. But until Jesus, by his death and crucifixion, took the keys of death and hell, defeated death and hell, believer spirits went to a place again of God's protective custody. It's described in a story Jesus told where he describes that place as Abraham's bosom. David spoke about that place, referring it as to Sheol, the place of the dead. And he said, I know when I die, my spirit's going there. But David said, I know you won't leave me there. One day God is going to come for me. I don't know how he's going to do it, but God's going to come for me. Well, Peter and others tell us that while Jesus' body was in the grave, in his spirit, he went into the place of the dead and he declared his victory and he let out all of God's people from Adam up until his own day. He was going into paradise to announce his victory. And as he went, who was going with him? the thief who was executed next to him. That thief would go with Jesus into paradise almost as a personified exclamation point to what Jesus was declaring in that moment. He had a ticket to paradise. Now, when I say where you have been, it doesn't have to determine where you're going. I'm not suggesting that your past doesn't have a profound influence upon you. It does. And that's why God frequently calls us to visit the past. Visit. In order to understand how it gave rise to spiritual deception. But he never calls us to accept the past as our permanent address. Or to make the past a dumping ground for blame. Because the eternal God is far more powerful than our past. Amen. So your past was just a moment, a brief moment in time. Or a series of moments in time. But God existed before there was time. God lives in the eternal present. He doesn't wear a watch. He doesn't need a day timer. God is bigger than time, and so he's bigger than those moments in your life when you experience tragedy, or you experience pain, or you made horrific decisions. He's bigger than that. So those who trust him are never trapped in their past because God's bigger than your past. When you trust him, your future is shaped not by your past, but by his present and future grace. And the story of the thief affirms something else. It affirms that we can get anywhere from where we are right now. Because any place can be a starting point for faith. Any place. Nobody watching a criminal being executed on a cross would look at him and say, he's standing on the threshold of paradise. He's right there at the door to eternal life. Now, most people would say, you, you can't get to paradise from the cross. But he did. Because when you decide to place your faith in Jesus and call upon him, it doesn't matter where you're standing in that moment. He can get you where he wants you to be from wherever you are in this current moment. So we don't have to let life bully us. You can grow in grace in any environment, and here's why. Because it's growing in grace. It's not growing because of great conditions. 
It's growing in God's grace. And God's grace isn't limited by my current situation. God's grace isn't limited by my mess. God's grace isn't limited by my problems. God's grace isn't limited by my past. My, God's grace isn't limited by my present predicament. So as you live this new year, don't wait for everything to line up with God's desires for you. Instead, align your heart with God's desires and they will unfold. See, too many times we make the mistake of waiting for our circumstances to change. The Bible doesn't say those who wait for their circumstances to change will mount up with wings like eagles. It says those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and They'll mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. Too many of you are waiting for things to change instead of waiting upon the Lord who can change things. So align your heart with him. Give him a chance to show what he can do. He has an impressive resume. See, this story also affirms to us that your traveling companions don't have to determine how you travel. That's why the final judgment will not be on the group plan. See, all kinds of people cross our path in life. Some of them we pick, and some of them pick on us. Some bring baggage. Some bring blessing. Some inflict pain. Some inspire hope. Some flatten our tires. Some fill our tires. Some can even put together IKEA furniture. <laughs> but we don't, we don't get to pick who crosses our path. But while we can't always pick who impacts our life, we can decide who will have power over it. Let me say that again. We can't always pick who impacts our life. But we can decide who will have power over it. As that thief hung next to Jesus, he was surrounded with bad company. Because Matthew tells us, there was a constant stream of cynics, people who hated Jesus and what he stood for. And they stood around the cross and they mocked him. You said you were the king of the Jews. You said you were God in human flesh. Well, if you're God, come down from that cross. Save yourself. Save those guys that are up there with you. Show us a little something, Jesus, king of the Jews. And the King James Version says they railed against him. That's the company the thief had. And then just a few feet away on the other side of Jesus, there was an embittered thief, also dying because of his crimes. And he was mocking Jesus. And he was spewing his anger and his hatred towards Jesus. And he certainly doubted Jesus' identity and Jesus' power. So here's this man, not sitting in a church service where Christ is being worshipped, but hanging on a cross where every voice he hears is mocking Jesus. But he didn't let the people he was traveling with determine his destination. He couldn't stop them from mocking Jesus, but he chose not to let their unbelief have power over his life. And so while one, cross, one thief died with curses upon his lips, the other died with a promise reverberating in his heart. He couldn't stop the bad company, but he could choose to cast his lot with Jesus. This story indicates something else. It reminds us that how we have traveled in the past doesn't dictate how we must travel in the future. We all start our journey through life, as I said a few weeks ago, under the addiction of sin. We all start life as addicts. 
And some confess their addiction and come to Jesus and get free, and others deny their addiction and are separated from God forever. But we all start life as addicts. We're all sin addicts in recovery. And as I said, that addiction is not only fueled by delusion, but it's also fueled by the illusion of self-reliance, that we can figure things out on our own, that we don't need God's guidance. And the reality is, the ability to submit to God's leading through His Word and through His Spirit doesn't come to us naturally. In fact, in the natural, it's impossible. It has to come to us supernaturally as a result of the new birth. And once we experience that, we can travel differently. Rather than just giving it our best and hoping that it works out, we can go to God and His eternal truth. We can go to a God who knows everything. We can go to a God who will never lie to us. We can go to a God who will never steer us wrong, who will never lead us into temptation, who will always deliver us from evil, who will always put our feet just where they need to be. We can go to Him and live life under His management. You see, every believer ought to have a t-shirt that says, Under New Management. Because that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus doesn't mean you call on Jesus when you need a fix. It means your whole life is under new management. Jesus calls the shots, and you happily obey because you know he's going to steer you in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name and for your blessing. Now, this thief had obviously taken matters into his own hands. How did that work for him? He was on a cross. But when he made the decision to travel differently and to trust Jesus, he got his tickets. A final thing that our story reminds us of is that faith doesn't guarantee a painless trip. The thief was going to be going to paradise, but it wasn't going to be a pleasant trip initially because he was still going to experience all the pain of crucifixion. And he was still going to heave his chest and breathe his last. See, every trip has ups and downs, big problems, little irritations, no matter how much you love God. Ask Job. Ask Paul. Ask Peter. Ask Daniel. Ask Stephen. Ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Ask countless others. The suggestion that if I love God, my life ought to be painless, that's like saying if I love God, every color ought to be blue. It's nonsense. Life is never unanimous. Life is never one colored. Life is a mixture of hard and soft, good and bad, pleasant and ugly. But it doesn't mean we have to live in frustration. Frustration comes when you expect a smooth trip, when you feel you're entitled to a smooth trip, and then spend your days arguing every time you hit a pothole. And a lot of people spend their life arguing with the unfairness of life. God's fair, life isn't. Life will never be fair. One of the most obvious statements we can say is, life isn't fair, right, but God is good. Hey. If you focus on life isn't fair, you'll be bummed out and burned out all the time. If you focus on God is good, you'll be blessed. Okay? But following Jesus doesn't mean you get a free pass. See, if we demand too much too soon, we will overlook the treasures that we already possess. And the greatest treasure you possess if you're a follower of Jesus is God himself dwelling in you through his spirit. And that treasure cannot be taken from you when you hit a pothole on the road of life. In fact, that treasure is where you'll find your strength as you navigate your way through or around or over that pothole. So the story of a man who suddenly found himself holding one of two tickets to paradise reminds us that our biggest disappointment can become our divine appointment. Our biggest disappointment can become our divine appointment. There are few disappointments larger than being crucified. That's a real non-starter. How's your day? 
Well, I'm scheduled to be crucified, but other than that, things are good. <laughs> Who am I to complain? <laughs> His biggest disappointment, I got caught on being executed, became his divine appointment where he met Jesus. I can guarantee you in 2014, you're going to have some disappointments. Your heart's got to get broken. Things are going to happen that you would have never prayed for and that you won't be able to just quickly pray away. But none of those things and none of the things of your past and the people who are surrounding you and all the, none of those things will determine where you're going to be at the end of the year. If you want to be where God wants you to be at the end of the year, then like that thief, you just simply call upon the Lord and let him turn the disappointment into the divine appointment. Let's pray together. Father God, so many times as we make our way through life, we keep hoping for a change of our circumstances, a change in the people around us. We longingly wish that our past could have been different. We wish and we regret and we mope and we hope and none of that serves us well at all. But if we will choose to respond to your presence and entrust our lives to you, then past, present, none of those things will set our agenda or determine our destiny. You will. And the destiny that you have for us is better than we could ever, ever imagine. So as we launch into the first full week of the new year, we look at the story of a man who went from bad to paradise because of a simple decision to trust Jesus. And Lord, if we'll emulate his example this year, we'll finish well. Help it to be so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen.